All right, end times events. End times events. Now, our church's position uh, on end times events is what would be known as premillennial, post trib, post tribulation, pre wrath. Right. So, what does that mean? Premillennial people are talking about. Generally, these terms talk about the timing of when the rapture is, and that rapture is the gathering together of believers, right? And we sort of saw that in Matthew 24, and that's why we started there. I'm going to go through Matthew 24 in this sermon. But um, so premillennial, millennium, if you think about it, that's the thousand-year reign. We're saying that the rapture is going to occur before that thousand-year reign. Um, some people believe in what's known as our millennialism. They, they don't even believe that you know, the thousand-year reign exists and whatnot. So they're all these different views, right? But that's what premillennial refers to. It refers to the fact that the rapture happens before the thousand-year reign. And then you have post-tribulation pre-wrath, which is saying that the rapture will occur after what is known as this tribulation period, but prior to God pouring out his wrath on the earth. And if you're familiar with the events uh, in Revelation, you'll know the trumpet judgments and the vile judgments. That's what we're referring to uh, when we refer to God's wrath. Now, some people, like some Christians, will incorrectly, or in my opinion, incorrectly refer to our view as mid-tribulation. And the reason why they call it mid-tribulation is because they call the whole seven-year period described in the Bible um, as the tribulation, but we are defining it as the first half is tribulation, second half um, is God's wrath. So that's why we call it post-trib, pre-wrath. Um, but when you hear mid-trib, generally that's what you know, other Christians would call it because of how they refer to that entire seven-year period. Now, end times is not something that I think is worth you know, Christians dividing over and whatnot. Um, you know, it's a bit like the topic of the Trinity that we talked about not long ago. It's something that Christians can discuss, and it's, it's not a salvational issue. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of churches do divide over it uh, because it has some uh, sort of implications to, um, you know, what people believe, right? Like how, they, how they act today um, and some things that they hold, hold dear to the how, well, which, which obviously we would uh, disagree with if we have opposing views. So, but why is it important? Why is it important to understand what will happen in the end times? Because what you believe about what will happen in the end times is going to change how you act today. Right? And what do I mean by that? If you believe the rapture happens before the tribulation, and we've all heard, uh, I'm sure, uh, if we've been a Christian long enough, you know, the, the whole story of like, you know, oh, even, even before this servant ends, you know, Jesus could just come back, and then everyone's clothes will be like left on the chairs and everything like that. Well, that, I believe, is not true. Right? And when, when you read through Matthew 24, you can see the timeline very clear, right? But if you believe, if you've been sort of duped into believing that that's how the rapture occurs and it's just happy at any moment, at any time, and, you know, uh, and, and it'll happen before all these things that Jesus talks about, all the trials that believers are going to go through in those end times, well, you're not really going to care how bad the world gets, right? Because you know when the world gets bad, well, hey, we're going to be out of there. What does it matter how bad it gets? Because when it gets bad, we're going to be gone, right? So, you'll notice that a lot of people that believe in this pre-tribulation rapture, when we see how bad the world is getting, right, and we see how oppressive governments are getting, there's almost a smile comes on their face, right? Because it's like, the worse it gets, hey, it's, they want it to come faster. Don't do anything about it. We want, the, we want the rapture to come faster. We want to be out of here. But if you have to go through it, obviously that's going to change, you know, how you care about how the world is going. And often as well, um, the, the pre-tribulation rapture view is also very heavily linked with what's known as Zionism, right? And Zionism is when people mistake and you know, misunderstand, I believe, the Old Testament passages, and then they hold the current nation, the physical nation of Israel, too high, and you know, they say, oh, bless Israel, you know, this is, and it has very far-reaching political consequences, right? That's why now when you hear, like, Trump talking and all the politicians talking, they're always talking about, we're a friend of Israel, we're a friend, friend of Israel, right? It's this idea that the current nation of Israel, this current unbelieving, Christ-rejecting nation of Israel, is somehow still God's people, 
and they believe that they should you know, bless that nation and pray for that nation, as opposed to understanding that those references in the Old Testament is talking about the true nation of Israel, right? The true circumcision, which is believers, right? That physical nation um, is no longer God's chosen people. They were a picture of the true God's people. Like, like a lot of things in the Old Testament are a shadow. That was a shadow of the true Israel, and that's not what this sermon is, is about. But it is heavily linked in with the pre-tribulation rapture. This is why like these end times positions have a, have a lot of like on-flowing effects of what other people believe. It's a bit like the discussion of, of, of Calvinism, right? I mean, Calvinism and Arminianism, people talk about those two different views and they are contrary and they you change how people understand a lot of scriptures and this is why it's very hard. Uh, for you know them to come to agreement, right? Because it's like different ways they are actually reading the scriptures, and it's the same with the pre-tribulation rapture. It's also tied in with dispensationalism as well and whatnot. So this is why it's important um, because it will change how you act today. Now, whether you expect to go through the tribulation as well will better prepare you for it when it happens. See, like, if you think you're not going to go through hard times, this is why Jesus tells his disciples, in, in the world you shall have tribulation. You know, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Right? If you didn't know you were going to go through hard times, it's going to throw you off when you all of a sudden are going through hard times. And it's the same with marriage, right? It's like sometimes when you, you go through marriage counseling, talk about marriage, you, know, you need to expect that the hard times are going to come. You know, just don't think marriage is just going to be a bed of roses, always going to be happy. So then when it happens, you know that it, it does happen and you're more prepared for it. So it's no different to end times. If you expect to go through hard times, you'll be more awake and you will be more prepared to go through it. And obviously, if you know you're, you know, you're going to go through it, you know, how you live can impact when it happens. So you're going to care more about how your actions will impact the world because obviously that's going to change how quickly it comes. Um, you know, how bad the world gets, right? Because we have some level of, of control over when it may begin. All right, so today in this sermon, I want to talk about, kind of give you a general overview of how these events unfold. So in your mind, you can say, hey, you know, these are the things that will happen and in what order they do until, you know, eventually we are on the new heaven and new earth uh, eternally, Right? So let's get into it. We've got six sections. Well, first one is what is known as the tribulation, right? What is known as the tribulation period, right? Now, when will this, this end times period that Jesus refers to, which is commonly known as the tribulation, and I know some people believe that this word is, is more accurately for the last bit of that end times period, um, but I think it's accurate to be called, you know, this period to be called the tribulation because it's trouble and there's persecution towards believers, right? Now, when will the tribulation begin? Because sometime in the future, these events are going to start unfolding, right? And we, nobody really knows when it's going to start. And this is why the Bible talks about in Matthew 24, verse 36. It says, Of that day and hour knoweth no man... No, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. What day is that referring to? That's referring to the day when Jesus returns. Right? And nobody knows when that day will happen, right? Because nobody really knows when this period is going to start, right? But we'll know when we're in that period because there are certain things that Jesus has mentioned that will happen, and we know that we're, you know, we're now experiencing it, right? 2 Thessalonians, so we don't know when the day or the hour is, right? But we know from Matthew 24 that it happens after the tribulation. We'll look at that in a moment. But also in 2 Thessalonians 2, the Antichrist will be revealed, right? Prior to Jesus coming back, right? So we, for those of us who are awake, that, are know, that know what is going to happen in the future, and we have our eyes open, the man of sin, the Antichrist, will be revealed. This is the, the one that's going to rule the one world government, who's going to be pretending to be Jesus Christ. That will happen prior to Jesus returning. But when it happens, obviously we're already going to be in this end times period, but there are certain things that we know will happen and we'll know that 
we're actually in this period. That's why some people you know, say now, are we in this period now? I personally don't believe so, but we'll talk about that a bit after. 2 Thessalonians 2. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. Right? So this is the, the rapture, right? This is the day that Jesus Christ gathers us all together. That ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. What is he saying here? He's saying, don't let anyone make you worry that Jesus can come back at any time. That's basically what he's saying. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, which day is he talking about? The day that Jesus Christ returns shall not come except there come a falling away first and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. See, so, you, so Jesus can't just come back at any time, right? Because there's certain things that have to happen before he returns. And here it's very clear in 2 Thessalonians 2 that the man of sin, this is the Antichrist that will come, the beast of Revelation, will be revealed prior to Jesus Christ coming. And that's what Paul is saying. Don't let people deceive you into thinking Jesus can come back at any time because certain things must happen first. Who opposeth and exalteth himself, right? Revelation 12. Now, how long will it last? How long will this tribulation period last when we're talking about end times? Because there's always been tribulation throughout history, right? But if we're talking about this specific time period, you know, that is leading up to Jesus Christ returning. Well, in Revelation 12, uh, we read in uh, verse 6, this is why a lot of people think and believe that this period is going to last three and a half years. This is where they get these numbers from. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. So I'm just pointing out that time period, uh, but you can go back and read Revelation 12 because I'm going through quite a lot of passages, so I'm just pointing a few out. So a thousand two hundred and three score days, right? We see further down in verse 14, and to the woman were given, and this woman obviously represents God's people in this picture, right? To the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness. So this is us, you know, trying to escape, or well, believers escaping from the tribulation happening in that time, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and half a time. Right? So where do they get three and a half years from? If you divide 1,200 and three score it would be 60, so a score is 20 days. If you divide that by 30 days, which is the month in the Bible, uh, you get 42 months, right? Here, you see nourished for a time and time, so you have time, a times, and half a time. That's the three and a half being to allu alluded to again. And then in Revelation 13, verse 5, you see the 42 months mentioned. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking. This is talking about the beast. This is the Antichrist, right? And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 40 and 2 months. Right? So when the Bible talks about not knowing the day or the hour, that doesn't mean we have no idea when this could ever happen. We don't know the day and the hour, right? But we can know when it's happening, right? In the sense that we know that there's going to be this 42 month period. Right? We don't know necessarily when it's going to start, but when we realize the Antichrist is revealed, we know we're in that period. And then there are other signs that we'll talk about in Matthew 24, when we know Jesus' return is very soon, even though we may not know the day or the hour. So how long will this tribulation period last? Three and a half years. That's where they get this three and a half year period. And we see also with God's wrath, we'll see that same number thrown out. Now, what are the signs? So this is what we read in Matthew 24, leading you know, ha that will be happening during this period, right? Matthew 24, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. Right? For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive you. Many. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to lay, because if you, a lot of people, you know, obviously dispute about the events that are outlined in Matthew 24, 
and we can compare it with other places in the Gospels as well. But if you put it alongside Revelation 6 and 7, you can see how it perfectly aligns. What's described in Matthew 24 is also the events that are described in Revelation 6 in more detail. So we see here Jesus saying, many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. So not only are many, there are many antichrists, many people pretending to be Jesus, but there will be that man of sin, right? That beast that will actually pretend to be Jesus Christ. And in Revelation, we see that, you know, there's a, there's a wound where he's healed and he even tries to mimic the resurrection. So look at what it says in Revelation 6, verse 1. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts, saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. So this white man on the white horse is the Antichrist, right? That first seal being revealed, and that lines up with Jesus saying, Hey, that many will come claiming to be him. And obviously there will be the one uh, Antichrist as well. Verse 6, And ye shall hear of wars and rumours of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So compare that to Revelation 6 verse 3. And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, Right, so the first one's white, second one's red, and power was given to him that sat thereon, look at this, to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another, and there was given unto him a great sword. So you see how that red horse represents the wars that are going on at that time, the wars and rumors of wars and things that are happening there. For nation, Matthew 24, verse 7, For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines, and pestilences, and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginning of sorrow. So now Jesus mentions, hey, there's famines and pestilences. What do we see in Revelation 6, verse 5? And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hands. So what does this balances represent? This commerce, right? It's people weighing out um, their, their medals in order to buy things. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, a measure of wheat for a penny and three measures of barley for a penny and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Now, how does this line up with famines? Because you might think, well, you know, a penny for a measure of wheat and a penny for three measures of barley. It sounds really cheap, right? One cent. Well, a penny in the Bible is not one cent. A penny in the Bible is a day's wages, right? And we see the parable here that Jesus talked about in Matthew 20. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder, and went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. So the penny in the Bible is not the same penny that we think about, right? Where it's like one cent. Because that would make this very cheap. But when you realize that a penny is actually one day's wages, that's saying for a measure of wheat will cost you one day's wages. And three measures of barley is going to cost you one day of labor, right? So you can see how there is a famine going on. There's a shortage of food, and that's why it's very expensive. Not only is there famines in Matthew 24, but he says pestilences, right, and earthquakes. Revelation 6, verse 7, when he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And his name that sat on him was Death. And hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with, with hunger and with death. Imagine getting ki killed with death. I suppose there's no other thing that kills you. It's the fact that you just die. Death. And with the beasts of the earth. Right? So you can see how it perfectly lines up in Revelation 6. All these, in, 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 we're back to Matthew 24 now. All these are the beginning of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you. And you shall, be, you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. So you say, you think, look, there's always been wars, there's always been famines, there's always been pestilences. But see, what is going to be different in this end times period. And I think what's going to be different is there's going to be a sort of targeted persecution against believers. 
That's why people say, like, are we going through the tribulation now with COVID? We're losing our liberties and whatnot. Because it's not an attack on Jesus Christ himself. Like, we're not getting, you know, we're not going through tribulation because we're Christians, because we believe on Jesus Christ. I think that's going to be the difference. Why? Because the Antichrist coming is pretending to be Jesus, right? And we're following the real Jesus. So we're like going against who this man is. And I think that's why, it's going, that's the difference that's going to happen, I believe, in the end times. So when people say, are we going through it now? I don't think so, but I think today it's a, it's a precursor. We can get a taste of what it might be like and the sort of technology they might use to control us, but I think it'll be very clear when that persecution is heavily targeted at those that confess the name of Jesus Christ, the true Jesus Christ, in opposition to the Antichrist who is claiming to be Jesus Christ. Look at what it says here in Revelation 6. So you see here that people are being slain and hated of all nations for my name's sake. Revelation 6 verse 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal... I saw under the altar the souls of them, look, that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So you can see this persecution against believers. And that's why I think this period can be rightly known as a period of tribulation because it's, a, it's an increased tribulation towards believers of Jesus Christ. All right, going back to Matthew 24, verse 10. And then shall many be offended and shall betray one another and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. And because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. So as you see how a lot of people take this passage in Matthew 24, verse 13, out of context, because it is not talking about living a faithful life until you die so that you'll go to heaven. This is about this tribulation period saying that if you endure this time of tribulation, then you will be saved, right? Why? Because it's going to go on about how Jesus Christ will return, right? And we'll gather up everyone, right? So you'll be spared physical death. It's not, this saved is not talking about um, salvation. Verse 14, and this gospel of the kingdom, and I'm just showing you again how Matthew 24 lines up very side by side with Revelation, uh, in, in Revelation. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso read, let him understand. Let, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come to take anything out of his house, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. I'll just go back. I skipped over some of those verses. So in Matthew 24, we see here that the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom is going to be preached in all the world. And we see even in Revelation 14, I was, I was in Revelation 6 and 7 before, Revelation 14, we see, you know, another mention of this period. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. And if you're not familiar with Revelation, um, Revelation is kind of split into two, right? You have Revelation 1 to 12, which is kind of a timeline of events. And then it kind of starts to repeat itself uh, from, I think, 12 or 13 to the end. So this is why in Revelation 14 you see sort of events from the end times as well. In Matthew 24 also we see here in verse 15, this mention of this abomination of desolation. So this is like this idol that is put in a temple in the end times that people are commanded to worship and to bow down to. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet stand in the holy place. So here is where it's mentioned in Daniel. Daniel 11 verse 31. And arms shall stand on his part and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh 
desolate, right? So this is like a, an idol that represents like the beast and, and, and people need to, to worship, right, in these end times. So this event is very key, right? This, this abomination of desolation that is put up. Why? Because we know these things are going to happen in these end times. The man of sin is revealed. Now, what is the significance of when this abomination of desolation stands in the holy place? This is when things are going to get really bad, right? This is what the Bible talks about, great tribulation, and then people will need to flee, right? So there's a period of like when these things are happening, we don't really know this, then the man of sin's revealed, things are getting worse and worse and worse, and then he says, keep an eye open, for this abomination of desolation, because when that is erected in the temple, then things get really bad, and you need to basically be on the run, right? There's no longer, you know, just comfort and bunkering down and just trying to fly under the radar. It's you need to get out of there because now the trip, the persecution on believers is going to increase. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. So notice it's saying, it's like on the plane, where they say, leave your belongings there and get out. That's going to be like this when the abomination of desolation is set up. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. So this is going to be really hard. So notice that this is when it gets really bad, when the abomination of desolation is set up. So even though it's going to be difficult through this three and a half year period, you know, there's probably going to be okay in the sense that, you know, there'll be places to go to. But here, you're on the run. Verse 20, but pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day, for then shall be great tribulation. So these are people different, distinguish between that, just that general period and great tribulation where it really picks up for a much shorter time. And this happens right before Jesus returns, right? So that's why the Bible talks about if you endure unto the end, you'll be saved, right? Because this is where everybody's, they try, the, the, you know, this one world government led by the Antichrist is trying to wipe out all believers. For then shall be great tribulation such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And look at this, and except... Right, except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. Right, so you can see that's why in Matthew 24, when it says, He that endureth unto the end, the same shall be saved. What is it referring to? Well, it talks about it later on in the chapter. Right, except those days should be shortened. Right, and why? Except Jesus comes back and cuts this great tribulation short, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. So basically, Christ comes back during that really hard time of tribulation to cut it short. Then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. Right? So what is he saying here? Now, verse 24, For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So he's telling us, don't believe when they say, oh, you know, Jesus came back here or Jesus came back over there. And people are already claiming that today, right? Oh, Jesus came back in the Americas, right? Like the Mormons. You know, Jesus came back here. You know, he's living here today. He's amongst us. Saying, don't believe it, right? Even if they show great signs and wonders, right? Too many Christians are led by signs and wonders, right? And it's not wrong to, you know, signs and wonders obviously exist. You know, miracles happen. But it's when we put signs and wonders above God's word, right? Sometimes that happens, where people, they, they, they may experience something miraculous in their life, but does that mean it's leading you to truth? You need to test those signs and wonders by the word of God. So they'll show great signs and wonders, but, you know, it's not going to be possible to deceive those of us who are saved, God's people. If it were possible, they should delete, deceive the very elect. Behold, I have told you before, Wherefore, so wherefore means because, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. Behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. So if they're saying Jesus came back here, came back there, don't believe it. Because how is Jesus going to come back? Verse 27, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, 
What does that mean? Everyone's going to see this. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Now notice when is, is this event being talked about? After that great tribulation, right? For wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. Now if that wasn't clear enough for you, look what it says in Matthew 24, verse, verse 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. Right? So you see the tribulation of those days, and you have the great tribulation, you have the coming back of Jesus Christ, and then immediately after the tribulation of those days, this is why we are post-tribulation, shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. So notice here we have some key events that are happening. The sun darkens, the moon shall not give a light, the stars fall from heaven. Let's go back to Revelation 6 in verse 12. Notice how these events line up exactly what Jesus is describing. Verse 12, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. Look, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. So you see in Matthew 24, Jesus hasn't returned yet, right? Like he returns when these things happen. So same in Revelation. You know, you can't teach that Jesus returns before the sixth seal because it's at the sixth seal where the events take place that Jesus Christ returns, where the sun darkens and the moon doesn't give a light, the stars fall from heaven. And the heaven departed as a scroll. I'm reading from Revelation 6 verse 14. Together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. All right, let's continue in Matthew 24. And the powers of the heaven shall be shaken, and then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. All right, so pretty clear, right? It's after this great tribulation. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. Uh, Revelation 6, we'll go back there so you can see the same thing happening here. Verse 15, and the kings of the earth... So notice how it says all the tribes of the earth shall mourn. You see that happening in Revelation 6 as well. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb... For the great day of his wrath is come. And who shall be able to stand? Right, so you see how it lines up that Jesus' return, his return is not, oh, what happened? Where did, all the, where did all the believers go? No, his return is, he's here, hide us from the face of the Lamb and from his wrath. Right? Because some, they know now something is going to happen. Right? And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. Matthew 24. Okay, so those are the signs. And uh, we see in Daniel 9 as well, just an another reiteration of this middle of this seven-year period. Right? In Daniel 9 verse 27, He shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. A lot of people talk about Daniel's 70th week. Right? And I think a lot of people misunderstand that these weeks are like days, but this word can also mean seven-year period as well, because it's not really a word for a you know, seven-year period. There's a word for a seven-day period, that's a week, but they're using that word also for this seven years, right? So this one week, and look at this, and in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even unto, until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So even in Daniel, when it's talking prophetically about the end times, it talks about this 70th week in the midst of the week. So if it's a week is seven years and three and a half years, like is being described in Matthew 24 and in Revelation 6 and 7. In the midst of the week is when that abomination of desolation is set up. Remember, that's not when the tribulation starts. We don't know when it starts. Then the man of Christ is revealed, and you have great tribulation starts when that abomination of desolation is set up, and that happens in that middle of that 
seven-year period overall. Right? The second half goes into God's wrath. Now, I already talked about you know, whether we are in this tribulation period now. I don't believe it is. I think we're still a ways off because, um, in my opinion, you know, I think it, there's still a lot of barriers to the world coming together as one. Right, you know, and I think you know you'll see it a lot closer when you start to see you know countries not opposing each other. You know, obviously they're already trying to work together and whatnot, but there are still a lot of barriers to that, and that's why I think it's still going to take some time. You know, are we going to see it in our lifetime? I don't know. Will our children see it? I don't know. I mean, you know, it's a bit like timing the stock market, right? Like nobody really knows when this is going to happen, but when it happens, you'll know that it's happening, right? Um, but I think what we're experiencing now, it's, it's a precursor to what will happen, right, in terms of how they're going to control us. But I'll, ex I'll show you a few verses of how I think it will, it will play out in that time, right, as things get worse and worse. In Matthew 10, we see here Jesus talking to his disciples and talking about them suffering persecution at that time as they go and preach. But it's interesting that he kind of alludes to end times as well in Matthew 10. And this is why in Matthew 10, I believe it's somewhat prophetical about end times, even though he's talking only to his disciples and there is an application to what they're doing at that particular time as well. Matthew 10, verse 22, And you shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. But look, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. You see how it's very similar to Matthew 24, and it's like an allusion to what's going to happen in the end times. But when they persecute you in this city, flee ye into another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall have not gone over the cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. So it's interesting that I don't know whether we're just like fleeing and we're just in this, you know, in the forest and whatever, just foraging for ourselves for all the whole period. It seems like, you know, the the I guess the armies of this end world are kind of come and try and find people, and we're like on the run, like they were here, where they would trying to get away from the Roman authorities, I think in the end times, we'll be on the run from city to city. But then when it gets really bad, there's going to be nowhere to go, right? And that's where there'll be a short period of time. Some people believe it'll only be like 10 days where you'll be out actually in the wilderness and won't be going from city to city. But I think it's interesting here that Jesus says to his disciples and kind of alluding to end times that they're going to flee from city to city and they're not going to be able to go to every city before Jesus Christ comes back. So it seems like you'll have places to flee to, but when great tribulation comes, you're going to flee like into the mountains, right? You're not going to go into a city. Matthew 24, look at what it says here. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, and we already sort of referred to this, but I wanted to point out here, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Right, so you're no longer fleeing from city to city. Now you're literally, like in this time, fleeing into you know, the, 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 the outback, right? just out away from the cities. Revelation 12. Now, how are we going to take care of ourselves during this time? Because sometimes people think, well, do I need to prepare for this tribulation period? And I suppose it, it probably doesn't hurt to know how to find some food in the wilderness and you know, maybe have a little bit of gold on hand so you can take it with you and trade on the black market and whatnot. But some people think, you know, can I, should I bunker down? You know, start learning how to can things and start stocking up on like rice and beans and all that. That's not how you, you're going to prepare for this period, right? Because like we said, you're going to be on the run from city to city. You're not just going to have to bunker down with your, with your guns and your food and everything and everyone's just going to leave you alone. You're going to ride it out for three and a half years because they're going to come for you, right? So that's not how I think we're going to prepare for the tribulation. You've got to prepare to know that it's going to happen, but probably have some skills, you know, just to, 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 to be able to travel and whatnot and know how to travel light because I think that's how it's more going to be experienced. But even for those of us who are not prepared, you know, I believe that during this time, God will provide for those people that are awake enough to get out of harm's way. Revelation 12, 6, look at what it says, and we sort of alluded to this when we talked about the time period. It says, And the woman fled into the wilderness, look, where she had the place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. You notice how God is supernaturally providing 
Uh, and it may be like, you know, like Elijah was provided for when he went up on the mountain after Mount Carmel. You know, ravens brought him food and whatnot. So there is ways that God provided for Elijah, provided for the nation of Israel as they were in the wilderness. And it's interesting that, you know, they spent 40, day, 40 years in the wilderness and the woman here is flying into the wilderness, right? And they were uh, supernaturally provided for. Revelation 12, and to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for time and times and half a time from the face of the serpent. All right, so that's where I'm spending the majority of the time. I'll try and go through now the different events that are happening as we continue. So there's that tribulation period, right? And the things that play up or happen leading up to Jesus Christ's return, right? And there's going to be the great tribulation just prior when the abomination of desolation is set up. Now, the second period of time is going to be when the rapture actually occurs. In Matthew 24, verse 31. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the one end of heaven to the other. So this is when now the, the rapture, so Jesus Christ returns, everyone's going to see him. You know, the unbelieving world obviously is going to be fearful of him. To us, we look up for our salvation draws nigh, right? Because we are, this is when it's really bad now, and he's going to cut it short. So we're, we look up, and it's like we're saved physically, right? It's not about our spiritual salvation. Revelation 7, verse 9, And this, after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the lambs. I'm just showing you where the rapture is in Revelation. Clothed with white robes and palms in their hand. Skip down to verse 13 in Revelation 7. And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? Saying, basically, who, where do these guys come from? What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. He says, Why are you asking? He's like saying, Why are you asking me? You know where they came from. And he, said unto, and he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. See, so that's where the rapture is in Revelation 7. There's basically a great multitude happens of all kindred of nations and tongues. And we see it, Jesus gathers together his leg from, from one end of heaven to the other. So that's why there's all this great body of people from everywhere. He asks them, hey, where did they come from? Hey, these are they that came out of great tribulation, right? Because this is Jesus saving them from this great tribulation. We'll continue to read in Matthew 24 so you can see more about this gathering together. Now learn a parable of the fig tree. When his branch is yet tender and putteth forth leaves, you know that summer is nigh. Right? So he's, he's likening, like you can see the signs on a tree of when summer is coming. It's like here, you're not going to know the day or the hour, like when it just ticks over to summer, when this fruit's going to come, right? But you can know that it's happening. It's likewise with the end times. So likewise ye, when ye shall see all these things, know that it is near even at the doors. So you see how that's different to how a lot of people teach you don't know when the day or the hour is. You can have no idea. Jesus is saying here, no, when you see these things happen, know that it is near, right? That it's near. You don't know the day or the hour. But you know it's here. It's coming, even at the doors. Verily I say unto you that gen this generation shall not pass till all these things be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. But of that day and hour knoweth no man. So notice how he just said, a couple of verses before, know that it is near. And then he says, well, oh, that day and hour knoweth no man. So he can't be saying you have no idea when it's going to happen, right? You don't know the day or the hour. Knoweth no man, no, not the angels of heaven, but my Father only. And in another passage, Jesus says, as a man, not even he knows. <laughs> you know, I had this conversation once with somebody, uh, we were talking about the Trinity, Right? And uh, they were trying to make the point like, oh, Jesus doesn't know, but his father only. Saying like, you see, the second person didn't know when he was coming back, but the first person of the Trinity did. And I'm like, hey, you know, that's, that's blasphemous because, you know, if the second person of the Trinity is God, how can he not know everything? So you say, well, how does this work? Well, it's because Jesus Christ is both God and man, right? So you have to understand that when he's saying he doesn't know things, when he thirsts, when he's hungry, he's speaking in his, in his humanity. 
You can't say it's the second person of the Trinity speaking these things because then you're blaspheming the omnipotent, omniscient God, right? Uh, that he's not omniscient, he's not omnipotent and all-knowing, right? So you need, you need to understand it that it's the divine nature of Jesus Christ. This is not first person, second person of the Trinity. 37, but as the days of Noah were, I want to point out something interesting in this passage that I don't know if you guys have thought about, but I just was thinking about as I was reading through these, uh, preparing for this sermon. But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. So who is this talking about here? Is this talking about the unbelieving world being ignorant of what's going on and then, you know, obviously Noah represents the, the, the rapture, right? Being in Christ, being preserved from God's wrath and taken away. They go into the ark. Unfortunately, only eight were saved then. But, you know, when it comes to salvation, more than eight are going to be saved. Until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not, right? So who didn't know? It wasn't Noah. It was the, the world. The unbelieving know they were marrying and giving in marriage and going on with their life. Knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So notice that phrase there, took them all the way. It's not referring to Noah, which Noah represents those being raptured in Christ and taken away from God's wrath, preserved from God's wrath. It's talking about taking away the, the, the unbelieving world. Like, you know, there were people that were destroyed when God's wrath came. And in Noah's flood, everyone was destroyed, right? But in the tribulation, God's wrath is going to come, but not everyone's going to die. But with that phrase in mind, it just made me kind of rethink, like, have, have we misunderstood verse 40 onwards? It says, Then shall two be in the field, the one shall be taken and the other left. And I thought, no, normally how I've understood this is the rapture. Like, you know, like two are there and one is raptured and the other's left. But if you compare it with that passage, it seems like one being taken, meaning one is going to die in God's wrath and one isn't, right? That's what I'm wondering. Um, so two shall be in the field. Because remember, when the abomination of desolation happens, we're told to flee and if you leave your coat in the field, don't return back and get it. So what are, what are they doing in the field? You're meant to be running away from the field. So I have a feeling that the two here are like two that don't get raptured and then God wrath, has come, God wrath is poured out and one of them is killed, right? Also here in verse 41, it says, two women shall be grinding at the mill. Now, if the great tribulation is happening, you ain't grinding at a mill, you know what I mean? Like, you should be on the run. That's what I'm thinking. So that's why I'm thinking this is not referring to it may not be referring to those that are being raptured. It may actually be referred to those that get killed during the tribulation. So maybe one in the field gets struck and obviously there's fire comes down from heaven. So maybe wherever these women are grinding at the mill, you know, that gets broken up, right? And one of them dies, as in their life is taken, like the flood took away the lives of all those in Noah's days, as opposed to raptured, which is how... Most people would understand this. This is how I understood it. So I just uh, was reflecting on that as I uh, read through it. I thought I'd share that with you. Watch therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord doth come. So the rapture is alluded to in other passages. 1 Corinthians 15. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. So notice that Jesus returns with the trumpet in Matthew 24. The dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. What happens at the rapture? At the rapture is referred to as the resurrection, but those that are alive, their bodies will get changed as well, those of us who are saved. 1 Thessalonians 4, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Right. So those that are you know, in heaven, right? They are reunited with their bodies. So when it says the dead in Christ are right, because their bodies come out of the earth, it's reunited with their soul and spirit that is in heaven. And then it goes to meet Jesus in the air, right? As he gathers us all together. Verse 17, those of us who are alive at the time and remain, right, throughout this tribulation, because a lot of people have been killed throughout this tribulation period, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Right? So that is the rapture that happens after the tribulation, right? And we get our new bodies. And this only happens to those that are saved at the time, 
when Jesus Christ returns. Now, third period is God's wrath. God's wrath. And we'll go through these sections quicker. They're shorter sections. So after, just like when Noah, like the Bible describes, he went into the ark, that same day, God's wrath happened, started raining. It's saying the day we are taken out, that's when God's wrath starts, right? And Revelation goes into great detail over things that God is basically judging the earth with, where he's you know, basically throwing things at the earth and shaking it up, causing earthquakes and whatnot. Not everyone dies during this period. Like I said, in Noah, everyone did get wiped out. But in, in uh, God's wrath here, not everyone is killed at this time, but a lot of people do die. Revelation 8. And the seven angels, I just read just this passage from Revelation 8 to give you an idea of the things that happen in God's wrath. And, it, and these are the trumpet judgments and vile judgments that you read about in Revelation. Verse 6. And the seven angels which had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. The first angel sounded and there was followed hail and fire mingled with blood. And they were cast upon the earth. And the third part of trees was burnt up and all green grass was burnt up. So now you can see how these two in the field, one is going to die, right? Because, you know, if he doesn't escape this bushfire, they're, they're going to die. And the second angel sounded and as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea and the third part of the sea became blood. And the third part of the creatures which were in the sea and had life died and the third part of the ships were destroyed. And the third angel sounded, and there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of the waters. I don't know what the significance of the third part is, but it's interesting that God just decides, I just want to affect a third of everything. <laughs> and the name of the star is called Wormwood, and the third part of waters became Wormwood, and many died of the waters because they were made bitter. So bitter is like poison. Remember when, uh, I think it was Elisha, made the stew, right? And they threw the wrong herb. It was like bitter. It refers to it as bitter. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened. And the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. So obviously we can't be raptured after this seven-year period. God doesn't do this to his children. Right? He, so he takes out the righteous like just Lot was taken out of Sodom and Gomorrah. That was a picture of what's happening here as well. But this is happening now across the whole earth. Right? Across the whole earth. Now, how long does this period last for? Well, during this time, there are God's two witnesses as well. A lot of people believe they are Elijah and Moses preaching to the people. Uh, Revelation 11, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar, and them that worship therein. But the court which is without the temple leave out and measure it not. And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy a thousand two hundred and three score days clothed in sackcloth. Right? So during this period, there is the two witnesses preaching. Obviously, they end up getting killed and the world is celebrating that they're dead. Um, this is happening during, even while God's pouring out his wrath. So that's why God is judging the world, but there are people still alive, still hating on God during this time. Right? So we have you know, the tribulation, the rapture's occurred, now God has poured out his wrath. Now, after God pours out his wrath, this is now the start of the millennial kingdom, the millennial reign of Christ. What is the millennial reign of Christ? It is the thousand-year reign that Christ will actually reign, rule and reign with us who took part in the first resurrection on this physical earth. Right? So this is different to the new heaven and new earth, which we'll talk about later, but he will actually, after he's poured out his wrath, so he doesn't completely destroy it, right? But a third part of it is, you know, die and is affected. But then he comes down to rule and reign on this earth. And that is the millennial kingdom. Revelation 19, let us be glad this millennial kingdom starts off with the marriage supper of the Lamb. Right? Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the Lamb is come and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, 
for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. Now for us, the marriage supper will be sitting down you know, with Jesus Christ. But here as well, part of this marriage supper is also the slaughter that happens when Jesus Christ returns. He saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not. I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren which have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him was called Faithful and True. So notice when the first seal was open, and there was one sitting on a white horse going forth conquering and to conquer, notice how he's trying to be Jesus Christ, because when Jesus Christ returns, he will come on a white horse, right? But upon him was called faithful and true, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. So notice how not everyone is killed during God's wrath because there is a contingent of people there taking up arms to fight Jesus and his armies as he comes to take over and rule and reign for a thousand years, like the Bible says, with a rod of iron. Verse 12, his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his eyes were many crowns, and he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. So it's interesting that Jesus is actually ruling here as a dictator, but you know, he's a benevolent dictator. He's like the ideal situation where you have a dictator that actually knows everything and is righteous. Right? That's the perfect scenario, right? And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And I saw an angel standing in the sun, and he cried with a loud voice, saying to all the fowls that fly in the midst of heaven, and why am I reading this to you? Because whenever we think of the marriage supper of the Lamb, we don't usually get this picture. But I want you to notice that part of the marriage supper of the Lamb is this great slaughter and it's the birds of the field and everything actually coming to feast on the carcasses that are left. Come and gather yourselves together unto the supper of the great God that he may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of captains and the flesh of mighty men and the flesh of horses. So these are the ones that are in opposition to us. Right? And of them that sit on them and the flesh of all men, both free and bond, both small and great. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. So notice it's a first resurrection. So that tells us you know, that there's a second resurrection that's going to happen, and we'll see that later in Revelation 20. But it's saying, blessed is he that hath part in this first resurrection. Why? Because if you are saved prior to Jesus returning and you take part in that rapture and that new body and you get to then take part in this thousand year reign, because if you get saved after that period, right, then you're going to live like your standard 80 year life or whatever, die. You know, if you're saved at that point, you'll be in heaven, but you won't get to take part in this thousand year reign physically in your new body and rule and reign with Jesus Christ. Now, who, that, that will answer the question to you, like who are we ruling over? Because some people believe that through God's wrath, everyone gets wiped out. But if everyone gets wiped out, then who are we reigning over, you know, for a thousand years? Well, we're reigning over unbelievers and believers who didn't take part in the first resurrection that survived God's wrath, right? So I guess the two-thirds that survived. That's who we're ruling and reigning over. And people can still get saved, I believe, during that period, you know, that thousand-year reign, because now Jesus Christ... But it's not, a per it's not a sinless world. So we're not in the sinless world yet at this thousand-year reign, right? There's still unbelievers there. Jesus has to rule with a rod of iron, right? Because he's ruling, you know, over the whole world, the true, perfect, one-world government system that Jesus will put in place. But... Like I said, we're ruling over people that are unbelievers. Now, how do we know that they still exist? Because in this thousand-year period, a coup happens, right? Like, so over this thousand-year period, people don't want Jesus Christ to be ruling around. They don't like 
the righteous rod of iron that Jesus has. And over this thousand year period, a contingent of people, this, uh, what do they call it? What's the word for it in the Bible? Insurrection is happening, right? Verse 7, and when the thousand years are expired, so this thousand year reign is just a couple of verses in the Bible. Even though it's a thousand years, it's like Revelation 20 says it starts, and then a couple of verses later, a thousand years is over, right? Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. So at the end of this thousand year reign, this millennial, king, millennial reign, because at the beginning of it, Satan is bound and put into hell. But after the thousand year reign, he's let out. And shall go out, verse 8, and deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle. So you ask, who is he gathering together? All the people that are not happy with Jesus Christ ruling and reigning and don't want to be under his rule. They are deceived by Satan, get together for one final battle. Right? So you remember there was a battle when Jesus came to rule and reign and there was a great slaughter, but he didn't wipe them all out. Here he wipes out the rest of them. To gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea, and they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city and fire. So this is like the capital city of the world, right, where those rule and reign from. So it's kind of like, you know, what, you know um, ACT, right, in uh, a Parliament House. This is like kind of like that city where all the rulers are. And devoured them, and the devil that deceived them. Ah, uh, sorry, compassed the camp of the saints round about. And the beloved city, look at this, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. It's funny that it's like just deals with them in like half a verse. You know, there's a huge insurrection that happens, it's fully surrounded the city, and then half a verse, fire just comes down and they're just all dead. And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So that's the thousand year reign. After God's wrath is poured out, at the end of that thousand year reign, there's this final battle of Gog and Magog. They're wiped out. And after this thousand year reign, then you get to the white throne judgment. Right? The white throne judgment. Revelation 20. And I saw a great white throne. This is why it's called the white throne judgment, because it gets its name from Revelation 20. And him that sat on it, whose face, the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. You remember in Matthew 24, remember when Jesus said, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. This is that time. This is when heaven and earth passes away, right? And it's found no place for them. So when we go to the white throne judgment, there's nothing else there. It's only the white throne judgment. Everyone else is there. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So this is the second resurrection. Some are going to be res resurrected unto life, right? some to damnation, because those that are saved, this is when they also get brought out at this white throne judgment. The sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. They were judged every man according to their works. Right? And if they're saved at that time, so this is not us getting judged, right? At the, in this time here. These are those that have not been resurrected yet. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I remember somebody said to me once, like, it says here, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So doesn't that ever make you think? So that there were people found, that there were people there that were found in the book of life and were not cast into the lake of fire. I don't know if you ever thought of that. So, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That means there were people that were found in, written in the book of life. But this is not us, right? We're not getting judged according to our work. We've already been resurrected, right? Was not written, it was not found, was written, uh, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now, along with the judgment of condemnation to those that don't believe, we also have the dishing out of rewards. So this happens at that same time, at this white throne judgment. It's the judgment seat of Christ. In Revelation eleven eighteen, the nations were angry and thy wrath is come and the time of the dead that they should be judged. And, so this is where we come into the picture now, that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. Right, so not only is it a time 
where people are judged and cast into the lake of fire. Whosoever is not found written in the book of life is cast into the lake of fire. But it's also for believers where we are rewarded for the works that we do for Jesus Christ. And uh, the Bible refers to this. Romans 14. Why dost thou judge thy brother? Why dost thou set it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. For it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. And I mentioned that in a previous sermon, that this will be a time when those in hell have a, a moment of reprieve. And that's why everyone will be bowing the knee to Jesus Christ. At that moment, the great white throne judgment happens and we also receive rewards for the work that we do. 1 Corinthians 3.13 Every man's work shall be made manifest. For the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. Now the last period I want to talk to you about, this is where it all ends, right? In Revelation 21, um, the new heaven and the new earth. The new heaven and the new earth. Revelation 21, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more seas. A lot of people think God is going to fix this earth, you know, rule for a thousand years and then make, fix this earth back to, to the same. But that's not how God works. Right? God doesn't, when he makes things perfect, he doesn't fix it, he just replaces it. Right? And this is why you get this parable. Um, you notice here, the new heaven and the new earth, first heaven and first earth were passed away. If you remember the parable of the wine bottles and the garment, Matthew 9, I just got this verse just to show you. No man putteth a piece of a new cloth unto an old garment, for that which is put in to fill it up taketh away from the garment, and the rent is made worse. Right? So God doesn't fix something old with something new. He just replaces what is old with what is new. And he's going to do the same with heaven and earth. Right? And that's why he, the new heaven and new earth comes, the old heaven and earth passes away. But I want to show you this connection here in Hebrews 1 where he refers to the world like a garment. And thou, Lord, in the beginning has laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens are the works of thine hands. They shall perish, but thou remainest. They all shall wax old as doth a garment. So notice how he's not going to fix the new gar old garment with a new garment, he's just replacing it. And as a vesture shalt thou fold them up and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall not fail. This is a very important thing when you think about um, when people throw the accusation at God saying, oh, you know, this world, it's all broken, it's not perfect, what is God doing about it? And they say that because they think God, they expect God to fix this current world. But you've got to know this is not, how, this is not God's plan. God's plan is not to fix the current world. He will rule and reign over this messed up world for a thousand years with us. But his plan is going to be to replace it. Right? So that's why he's not fixing it. He'll, I guess he'll fix it a bit when he comes. But his modus operandi is to try and get as many people to the new heaven and the new earth as possible. Because one day he's going to replace it. Right? It's like you don't, he's not a panel beater. He doesn't fix a smashed up car. He's like a manufacturer. You know, <laughs> supplying a new car. Right? Revelation 21, this is where we'll, we'll finish, got a, just a couple more verses. Revelation 21, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men and he will dwell with them and they shall be his people. And God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. I don't know how many times I've read this verse, but it's just such a beautiful verse every time I read it. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write for these words are true and faithful. You know, that's what we have to look forward to. For those of us who are saved, you know, this is when all the former things have passed away, the tribulation, the rapture, God's wrath, you know, and then the thousand-year reign, and even there's the, the insurrection there. Then you have the white throne judgment, and then we have all of eternity uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ. 
You know, often people, when you think about being in heaven for all eternity, often people will think, you know, wouldn't we get bored in heaven? <laughs> you know, like, surely you will run out of things to do. Um, but I don't think so. I think God is an infinite God, and I think he's the creator of pleasure. I think he knows how to keep people entertained for all eternity. I think there'll be plenty of things to do in heaven, and there won't be ever a time where you get bored. So I just end on this passage here in Psalm 16, verse 11. It says, Thou will show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. And look at this. At thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. We're not going to get bored in heaven. It's going to be a wonderful place, but we need to make sure we're going. We right? need to make sure we believe on Jesus Christ, you know, and uh, make sure we take part in that first resurrection. So just to recap, there it is. So in your mind... You know, give you that overview and you know how it all lays out. Maybe, maybe in your mind you may realize now, oh, I'm mixing up some events. I'm putting some things here and I hope that gives you a, a good outline of a timeline. So we don't know when that's going to happen. It's going to last about three and a half years near the end of it when Antichrist is revealed throughout it. You know, he's going to set up the abomination of desolation. It's going to be really bad. Jesus returns to cut it short, right? That's where we get gathered. After he gathers us together, his wrath is then poured out for about three and a half years and about a third of people are wiped out on the earth. Then he comes to rule and reign for a thousand years and there's a great battle of people that don't want to be ruled and reign. That's the slaughter. That's also the marriage supper of the lamb for those birds and whatnot. After that thousand year reign, Satan comes out, deceives the nations. Jesus kills them all with fire. And then you have the white throne judgment when everyone is resurrected before God and they are judged every man according to his works. This is also when the judgment seat of Christ happens where we receive our eternal rewards for all eternity. And then we will live with Jesus on the new heaven and new earth and it's going to be a great place. All right, I hope that you learned something today. I hope that encourages you, all right? Uh, let's use our life for this, all right? And not waste it. All right, let's pray. Lord, thank you so much for your word. Thank you for the encouragement this morning. Lord, help us not to waste our life. Help us to have this eternal view and we know what is going to happen. We know we're going to win, so help us, Lord, not to get discouraged with what we see in the world, but help us to fight as you would want us to fight. And we pray, Lord, that we do indeed do that. We do indeed spend our life being an ambassador and a soldier. So, Lord, that we'll be rewarded more at that white throne judgment. So, Lord, help us. Help us to keep our eyes on the things of eternity and not on the temporary things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.